The First Estate, Religion in Review, with Dr. Russell Barber. Today on The First Estate, we'll examine Jewish mystical meditation, talk about Bibles for the blind, and examine a new way to view television from a Christian perspective. Let's begin with Jewish mysticism. There's a school of Jewish thought which suggests that the Torah has two levels of meaning, its outer plain meaning and an inner secret meaning that can be revealed through mystical meditation. Here to make the point is Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan, spokesman for Jewish mysticism. Thanks for coming, Rabbi. My pleasure. What is mysticism? Well, mysticism is usually defined as a direct experience of God. And in Judaism, it has a particularly important role. I think people often forget that Judaism is an Eastern religion. The prophets were really mystics. Mm -hmm. And also in Judaism, I've always very often wondered what's the Hebrew word for mysticism. Well, tell me about that. There's a connection, isn't there, between the Hebrew word and, and mystical meanings? Well, in general, in, in, especially in Kabbalah, but even in general Judaism, you find the analysis of words very often yields a deeper meaning of what something is. And one of the words, the closest thing I could find for mysticism might be devakus which means attachment to God. And literally means attachment, like you attach two things together, a person mm -hmm. attaches himself to God. And this is, the, this is what mysticism is, having the direct experience of the divine. How long has mysticism been practiced in Judaism? It it's really has an ancient tradition, doesn't it? Well, if you wanted to be pure about it, you start with the prophets. As I said earlier, a prophet, a prophet is really a mystic. Uh -huh. Because how does a prophet get his, his inspiration? It's a direct experience of God, and this is how we define mysticism. But of course, it's usually known to us, Miss Jewish mysticism, through Kabbalah. It seems that the prophetic tradition was somehow kept alive. Uh, probably after the destruction of the first temple, it, was, it, it became, a, uh, became a secret teaching. And eventually it was kept alive through the Kabbalah. Define the Kabbalah for me. What does that mean? The Kabbalah, well, the word Kabbalah really means, simply means tradition. That's all it means. And, and, and I think this is what, I'm, what I was saying, that, that let me, let me also, also interject another interesting thing that in the Talmud, the teachings of the prophets are referred to as Kabbalah. I see. And it seems that what, what Kabbalah was, the tradition that was kept alive, besides the general tradition of Torah and Talmud, was the tra tradition that was kept alive from the time of the prophets of how to get the, keep this direct relationship to God. But the Kabbalah basically is considered to be a, a collection of interpretations, if you will, of scripture of a meditative nature, is that right? Of a mystical nature? Well, there are really there are several branches of Kabbalah. They're not actually officially... There's no book. <laughs> there's, no, there, 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 there's no book since there, there's, there's no catalog that says A, B, C. But, right. But in my st own study of Kabbalah, I found that there are more or less three basic branches of Kabbalah. What are those three? And the most familiar, of course, is, the, is, and that which is studied by most people who are considered Kabbalists, is the theoretical Kabbalah, which essentially, essentially tells, you, tells you the mechanics of the divine realm. I, I think it's the easiest way of saying it, the sphere of the divine spheres, the angelic worlds, the worlds sort of the Sort of a philosophical overview? A, a philosophical overview, and that really explains the other two branches of Kabbalah. And not only that, but it gives the underlying philosophy of Judaism in general. The second branch of Kabbalah, which uh, in the past few years I've been spending a lot of time investigating, and it's, incidentally, it's interesting, there are very few published books on the source. On, on, on this branch, to a large degree, to work on it, I'd have to, I'd have, I've had to go through libraries and go through ancient manuscripts, very often transcribing them and translating them for the first time. But this deals with the meditative Kabbalah. This is actually how to attain this direct experience of God through meditation. What is Jewish meditation? Yeah, I, let me, while you're talking about that, show the audience that here are three of your current books that you've just... Uh, By the way, the second book there, the middle one, that, that can't be seen, Meditation in Kabbalah, I think was one of the first books that really opened up the whole idea of Jewish meditation. Really? Until, until then, people had no idea there was even such an animal. But so when we're talking about, we've talked about two categories of the Kabbalah. We've, just to, to recap, we've got the philosophical aspects of it, the meditative. Right. What's the third? The third is the magical. And what do you mean by that? Which actually in, in folklore or very often in, in literature and fiction is the, most, the one that's most played up. Well, again, about very little is known. There, there is an aspect of Kabbalah, I, I, I would imagine starting with the Book of Creation, 
which actually tells a person, tells a person almost how to manipulate, not only how to manipulate himself to get himself closer to the divine, but how to manipulate sort of the, sort of the strings of creation or the forces of creation and actually bring about changes in the physical world. Is, would this be the category of the Kabbalah that uh, uses amulets and, and uh, shall we call them props or, or magical items? Precisely, or, or for instance the making of the golem uh -huh. would, come on, would, would come under that. Uh, you know, th that brings me to the fact that regarding magical practices and so forth, uh, the, the Bible uh, suggests there should be no idolatry. And isn't it in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy that it suggests that there can be no use of, what is it, chants and, and uh, enchantments. enchantments and witches and things of that nature? How, how does that jibe with the fact that amulets and, and these items can be used, hopefully, to change the physical world? Well, here you, 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 have, you have two levels. First of all, the Kabbalists themselves yeah. warn against the, about the dangers of these things. It's not something that's taken very, uh, very trivially. Second of all, in, in the very passage in Deuteronomy, the Bible goes on to say, I will raise a prophet to you. In other words, there are forbidden me means of trying to ascertain, say, the knowledge of the future or knowledge of the hidden, and there are permitted means. In Talmudic literature already, the distinction is made much more clearly. And it's, it, it, it seems really, it depends on where, one's co where one person is coming from. A person is trying to manipulate the force of creation through the dark side, through the, what the Kabbalists would call the Sitra Achra, the other side, the dark forces. This is absolutely forbidden. And it's forbidden not so much because of the, because of the person is manipulating nature, but because he is actually trying to manipulate through, through that which goes against the divine. So the, the idea is that the only, only thing that's acceptable, as far as the Kabbalah is concerned, in terms of use, using magical powers, would be for the positive or for the good. Right. And, and then only, only in the most circumscribed uh, areas. In fact, there are many Kabbalistic sources that seem to indicate a person actually needs uh, a divine directive before one can use these forces. Would you consider yourself a mystical rabbi? Actually not. I consider myself an ordinary orthodox rabbi, or an ordinary rabbi. I really don't like to even throw labels on. Do you utilize any of these magical aspects in your study of the Kabbalah? Magical, definitely not. Meditative, yes. Tell me about that. What kinds of experiences have you had? How would a, how would a, a service in a, a, an ordinary 20th century synagogue that was a meditative ser service, how would it differ from an ordinary service? Well, actually, that brings back, to, brings back to another thing. People don't realize to what degree the ordinary synagogue service is based on Kabbalah, is based on Jewish mysticism. It has many roots in Jewish mysticism. In fact, many prayers are specifically taken from the mystical tradition. The difference would, I think the ma major difference would be that a, a mystical service would be much slower. Slower. And it, the main difference would be internal. I mean, let me give you a good example. Please. Let's say in the Amidah, which is the standard pr Jewish prayer said three times a day. Right. Incidentally, the very fact that it's said three times a day gives it almost a mantra-like quality, this prayer. But you see, the, the person praying would say the great, the great, mighty, and awesome God. So a person could think of this intellectually, what, what, what these mean, things mean. But the mystic, or the person who, who's, who's really delved into the prayer when he says, great, he literally becomes aware in every possible way, with every fiber of his being, of what God's greatness means, what God's strength means, or the awesomeness of God. So, 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 so actually, it's, it's not an intellectual, but a direct experience as to what the words of the prayers mean. So you're suggesting that when you say it's slower, that the meaning, the significance of each word would be meditated upon before moving to the next in the prayer. So the full awesomeness of the meaning would somehow be transmitted to the individual. Precisely. And actually it's interesting, throughout Jewish literature, not only Kabbalistic literature, but even legalistic literature or Talmudical literature, one, one finds this thread of the idea of kavana, of concentration on the words, of making every word count, of making every word change you as a person. Rabbi, how popular is it becoming? How are more people getting interested, more Jewish people getting interested in, in, in mysticism, and is it more popular in one age group as opposed to another? Well, in general, I would, I would say yes, that in general, in general, mysticism has become a, a sort of part and parcel of our pop culture today, so a lot of young people are becoming interested in Jewish mysticism. In fact, I meet many young people who have had an interest in Eastern religions, and when they discover that Judaism has a parallel to offer, 
they, they, they just eat it up. But what about some of the, shall we call them, more conservative groups, the older group perhaps? What do they think about this? Is, this uh, is it something they consider legitimate, even though we know it had its roots in ancient tradition? It, depend, it depends whom, but in, in general, uh, Orthodox Judaism sees uh, the Kabbalah and mysticism as being an uh, important part, an important segment of the tradition. There, there are all kind of taboos against studying it for somebody who's not, who hasn't the proper background or the proper uh, age. But mm, and people, there are a little bit of people are a little bit afraid of it, but people recognize it as being legitimate. You see it as a growing thing, however. I see it as something growing in importance throughout the entire spectrum of Judaism. I want to thank you very much, Rabbi, for coming and talking to to us about a, a very interesting aspect of of ancient tradition and contemporary Judaism. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure.